Today, Tammy is a midwife. She's also a volunteer firefighter. She once was a practitioner of Santeria. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Our Conversation. Tammy, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you taking your time. So you're a midwife today. Yes. You're a volunteer firefighter today. We've got to talk about that. <laughs> but I mentioned a moment ago that you were once a practitioner of Santeria. Yes. Now, someone knows exactly what that is, but somebody else is thinking, huh? Yes. Explain Santeria to me. Well, the definition is the way of the saints. And basically, it is a Spanish voodoo. Um, and it's incorporated with a little bit of Catholicism. So voodoo, everybody understands voodoo. Yes. This is the, the Latin form of, of, of voodoo, if you like. Right. So tell me a little bit about this. You were involved as a, a much younger person. What happens? What takes place? So it wasn't by choice that I was involved. Mm -hmm. It was involuntary. Um, I was a child and some family members practiced it. Okay. Um, I was baptized in it and participated in some rituals. Baptized? Yes. Practitioner of Santeria are baptized? Yes. Baptized by immersion? By immersion. Was oh, that so? Yes. Okay. And, and, and is that a ritual in and of itself? Yes. So the ritual is um, you dress in all white. Usually it's about seven days that somebody dresses in all white and there are certain criteria that you have to fulfill. And one of the criteria is that you get a beaded necklace. Okay. And those beads represent the God or the guardian or the saint, how you want to call it, um, that you, you're you dedicated to okay, sure. into the religion or cult. So so people have been to Cuba, I've been in Cuba. You see the people walking around dressed in white. Yes. These are practitioners of Santeria? Most likely. Yeah, okay. Most likely. Oh. And, and it varies a little bit. It's not like all Santeria practitioners follow a, a carefully delineated code of, of practice. It, it's all over the place, isn't it? Right. It is all over the place because when it was brought in from Africa and went to the Caribbean, um, they incorporated their own religion and their own inter interpretation and also p was passed down from generation to generation. So there's different ways of doing it. So this is a spiritualistic religion that originated in West Africa. Is it a stretch to say that this is witchcraft? No. That's what this is? That's exactly what it is. So when we're, when we're, when we're gently saying you were involved in Santeria, yes. the fact of the matter is you were brought into the practice of witchcraft. Yes. So what did that look like? Uh, I saw spirits on a regular basis. Um, I knew people who read tarot cards. I went to people who read tarot cards. Um, I knew people who talked to the dead, uh, people that were close to me that talked to the dead, um, or spirits. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, growing up, I also had a spirit that would stand at the corner of my bed every night. You saw spirits? Yes. What did you see? Uh, mostly shadows. How did you know there were spirits? Well, it's a feeling. It's a feeling. Um, a lot of the times the hairs would stand up in the back of my neck. Were you comfortable with it? Was it, was it a comfortable feeling? It was not a comfortable feeling. It never became a comfortable feeling? It never became a comfortable feeling. Um, well, it kind of did in the sense that when I asked a certain person what I was supposed to do and that that's what I was experiencing, they said, it's okay, you know, all you have to do is just, you know, say these things and it'll be fine. Or they would say, oh, that's your guardian, don't worry about it, they're here to protect you. Okay. So it was normal. Yes. But it, it, it didn't feel like a visit from your aunt. Not 100%, no. It's fascinating, isn't it, that you're involved, you're inculcated into something. Yes. You're told is, it, this is the the way we do things around here. Yes. Uh, it's not socially unacceptable given the circle in which you found yourself at the time. Right. But the practice of it didn't feel right. Not 100%, no. Yeah, okay. So you saw spirits, shadows and so forth, and by talking to other people and what you sensed, you understood that these were, wait, you understood that these were what? You called them spirits, but what was your understanding of what they were? Guardian angels or saints. Or um, sometimes it depends on the situation that you're in. Um, it could be a curse brought in by somebody else. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so when you say two things, when you say saints, that means the dead who've gone on and are in some other place now. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it could be family members, 
but it also tied in directly with Catholicism. So a lot of the saints that are in Catholicism were represented. Okay. So it might have been St. Mary, or it could have been St. Andrew, it could have been St. something else. Right. Okay, okay. And you mentioned just a second ago that the possibility existed that these things that you were seeing might have been negative, might have been a curse. Yes. Well, this would have to surely make you feel a little defensive, a little, little afraid. Yes, it did. Yeah? A lot of the times I would hide under the covers, and that's how I slept. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. About what age were you? I was in kindergarten. Oh, you were little? Yes. Oh. That's when it started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So was this frightening? I want to add to that. Was it, was it traumatizing? It wasn't traumatizing. No. You know, as you got older and you continued in it, you just got used to it and you would just tell yourself and it would, it would normalize. Okay. You would be conditioned and it would be normal. And that's what it became. It was normal for me. You went to school. I did. So you're in grade school. You're a seven-year-old kid in grade school. And yes. did you ever during show and tell say, hey, I've got news for you guys? Or was this something that you kept as a secret? You kept it as a secret. Oh, you did? You knew that it was a secret. I wasn't told that it was a secret, but you didn't talk about it. Not to anyone? Not to anyone. How openly did you speak to, you mentioned family, yes. about this? Like, did you ever, you know, at the dinner table, did you ever say, hey, I, I'm experiencing this or that or I yes you you would do that so when I was baptized I actually was given the gift of dreams and so I would talk to different gods or saints or different people of different cultures that practice the same thing in different languages and I would um, relay those messages and they would be interpreted so let me understand this the relaying of the messages it's you're dreaming, and in this dream, you're communicating with somebody. Yes. And you would have a message for X person from, from this saint, perhaps, and the saint says, I want you to tell your neighbor. I want you to tell your cousin. Mm -hmm. would, would it be like that? It would be more of, this is what's going to happen, or they would tell me to do things. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is what's going to happen. Right. And it happened? Yes, it would. Every time? Most of the time. Okay, so before we go any further, as a kindergartner, yes. you were exposed to, uh, drawn into, not of your own choosing, but right. so frequently is the case, right. uh, witchcraft. Yes. And based on what you're saying, s seeing the dead and communicating with the dead and, and, and receiving messages from somewhere, the other side somewhere, this is some pretty potent stuff. Yes. This is real, right? Very real. Yeah. Very real. There came a time that you realized or you believed that what you're in was bad stuff. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I know you know, the Bible says that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with principalities and powers. And you've had, I mean, we've all had first-hand experience with this, but you've had some pretty graphic interesting first-hand experience with right. this thing, this battle between good and evil. Well, the purpose behind Santeria is to have power. And Tell so when I, was, when I was baptized into it, um, uh, the, the guardian that I was given was the guardian of Shango. And Shango, he, um, the bead colors were white and red, and he was the, um, the god of dominance and power. And a lot of people, when they came into Santeria, it was either for protection or to get, you know, something that you wanted or to, um, uh, you know, dominate. Dominate how? I, suddenly you, you're, you're better at business or you're a better football player or you're, you're the smartest kid in your class or dominate how? It could be either dominating over a person, whether it be a relationship with somebody that, you know, that you want or it could be with money, um, you know, materialistic things. Most of the time it's that. It's really very interesting. I think if I would ask somebody on the street, tell me about Santeria, anyone who knows would say, yeah, it's some spiritualistic, witchcrafty thing. Yeah. I'd be almost willing to wager, were I a wagering man, that few people realize how real this actually is. So. How, I, I don't know that you can be a number, and I'm not, not asking for that, mm -hmm. but how prevalent is this? How common is this? Well, you'll find it in uh, all of the Caribbean, South America, um, 
it's in Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, um, Brazil, um, Haiti. I mean, Haiti calls it something else. Yeah, call it voodoo, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, you'll find it all over the place. And in those places, I mean, is it rare? Is it just this little tiny group of people who do this in the shadows? Or is it common? It's very common. Okay. It's very common. I mean, back where I grew up, um, there was locations called botanicas where it's just like a little corner store and you could just walk on in and get whatever things you needed to get or, you know, talk to the santera or santero, which is the priest of Santeria, um, and read, have tarot cards, psychic readings, and so on, spells. So we spoke about apparitions and you were seeing various things. Yes. You, you spoke about having dreams where you communicated with others who were also practitioners of Santeria. Yes. So this was, this was what? So in our, in our family, we were given a guardian, certain guardians, and um, her name was Tabitha. And she was, Biblical name. Yes, and she was a Haitian woman. Um, bit big. I could picture her face, and she mm. would talk to me. And you would talk back? And I would talk back. Yeah. Yep. Uh, another time I had a conversation with a Native American. Uh, one experience I had a conversation with Satan himself. And as you experienced those, from your perspective, were you really talking with a Native American? Do you feel like you are really talking with Satan, Satan? Or was this just an impression and role playing or something? I think part of it was role playing. I do believe that Satan is Satan, but I think the other characters that I spoke with were demons. Mm -hmm. So you have no doubt in your mind this was, this was demonic stuff that you were in the midst of. Absolutely not. Interesting, isn't it? You spoke about uh, psychic readings. Yes. Now, here, you know, you see Madame someone or other's shop front and she's advertising psychic readings. Ex explain what, what these were in your context. So when you see those madam, whoever, yeah. um, a lot of those, you know, tend to be scams. Mm -hmm. In the context where I was, it was a very serious thing. There was a back room in a botanica or in the house of the, you know, the witch. And, um, I mean, you had to pay and there were usually people there who you had to get permission to get in. So it wasn't something you could just talk to them easily. And the psychic reading would be about what? What, what are you learning in there? It all depends. It all depends on what you're looking for. Um, if you co go over there looking for something specific like a relationship, you know, they'll read the cards, you know, have the bones and the, animal bones. The bones. Yes. Animal bones. Yes. And they would read them, you know, they, they would, you know, shuffle the cards. You'd have to shuffle the cards. They'd give the cards to you. And these are tarot cards, just like tarot cards that people are, I don't want to say familiar with, but the ones that we see in, 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 in modern culture today, sometimes in pop culture. Slightly different. They're Spanish tarot cards. Okay. Um, so they have different characters. But so same idea. Dagger, same idea. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so you would have to touch the tarot cards in order to pass on whatever energy or you, what's going on in your life into the cards. And then the Santera would take the cards and then place them out and they would read them accordingly. They would read them according to the pictures that were on there, um, the order that they were put in, the colors that were prominent, you know, things that stood out the most to them. And then the bones would be fall into place in certain ways and they would read it according to their interpretation or what messages they received. You know, I, I remember being in an African country and, and meeting a witch doctor. He, he mm. became a Christian and invited us to his, his home to destroy all of his witchcraft mm. stuff. And some of what we destroyed that night burned. Sounds very much like the sorts of things that you were in, exposed to in Santeria. So I guess there are a lot of common threads that weave their way through this thing. Absolutely. You saw somebody standing at the end of your bed when you were a young person. Yes. And this happened with frequency. Uh, just about every day. Every day. Yes. Yeah. Now, now I've heard similar stories from other, other people. So again, this isn't this isn't rare or unheard of. This started when you were young. Yes, very young. Did did it leave you feeling uncomfortable? Very uncomfortable. Oh. But when I asked, you know, or I relayed, you know, the situation, what was happening, I was told that that were they were my guardian and they're there to protect me. Even though I didn't feel protected, I had to ac accept it because you know the person that told me I respected. Yeah. So tell me how this played out in your life. So you were, you were a young person and then a less young person. You were a practitioner of Santeria. 
uh, the objective of which, as you said moments ago, is to get power. Mm-hmm. So what happened? Were you, were you the top student in your class? Were you the most popular kid in town? Did you get the best job there was? How did this help you? I was the smartest kid in the class. I was an honor student. However, I wasn't the popular student. Um, you know, I was bullied a lot, and which kind of pushed me and propelled me into chasing Santeria on my own. It interests me that you were bullied. Yes. You had spirit guides in your life and somebody stood at the end of the bed watching over you to protect you. One might think that the, the saints of Santeria would have stepped in and taken care of the bullies. Did that happen? No. It didn't happen. As a matter of fact, it seemed like there was like a, a black cloud over my family. Like any type of tragedy that you could imagine that could happen would happen. And it was like back to back, one right after the other, one right after the other. Was there ever a time that you said, hold on a minute, the Santeria thing is not working like it should? You know, it's funny because now I look back and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this really doesn't work. Yeah. But, at <laughs> but the time? no, at the time, no, I just... Uh, when you're in it, um, you're you're thinking it, it it all has to do with how much investment that you give. So if you're not doing the right things at the right time and you're not putting your all into it, then you're not going to yield the results that you're looking for. So if you're if you're if you're experiencing all these tragedies and it's not working, it's because you're not doing your part. Interesting. So the the, the spirit guides aren't really very benevolent. No, they're not. It seems like they're the selfish ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Much more to ask you about. I really appreciate your time. I'm speaking with Tammy about her experience with Santeria, uh, witchcraft, and we're going to discuss how she sees the prevalence of witchcraft in society today. I'm John Bradshaw. This is our conversation. We'll be back in just a moment. Crystals, yoga, Ouija boards, witchcraft are back in vogue. What the Fox sisters popularized is now part of pop culture. Books and movies about witchcraft, wizardry, and magic are everywhere. What's often said to be just entertainment is part of something much larger and darker. Don't miss Dancing with the Devil, where we'll explore the rise of the occult, and you'll meet a young woman who overcame her involvement with the occult through the power of God. In a world where the media is saturated with occult imagery, in a society where ghosts and demons are treated as trivial and fun, it's never been more important to discern between the sacred and the profane. In Dancing with the Devil, you'll learn there's nothing new under the sun, and that the roots of what we see today go all the way back to the origin of sin. Dancing with the Devil Brought to you by It Is Written TV. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. Did you know that more than half of Jesus' parables address our relationship with money and material possessions? As God's children, we're stewards of the resources on this earth, and God has given us examples of how to do that well and wisely. As we study managing for the master till he comes, we'll learn how God asks us to care for our fellow man and how to achieve financial freedom through financial faithfulness. Come along for this important study and learn what it means to steward Christ's resources here on earth. Join us for a new It Is Written Sabbath School study each week on itiswritten.tv. Hello, I'm Ed Reed, former director of the Stewardship Department for the North American Division and the author of this quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Managing for the Master Till He Comes. Join myself and it is written Associate Speaker Eric Fleckinger for this quarter's study in which we will learn what the Bible says about faith and finance, digging into the concepts of stewardship and the biblical principles of money management throughout the stages of life. In an age where not only individuals and companies but also entire cities and states are declaring bankruptcy, the timeliness of this message is more important than ever before. If you enjoy coloring, then you are going to love the Buried Treasure Coloring Book from My Place with Jesus. The Buried Treasure Coloring Book has more than just pictures to color. You'll also enjoy activity pages, each accompanied by their very own audio story. Mr. Dixon came across a small, well-weeded rice patch 
out in the middle of a field. Get ahead of a rainy day or a relaxing evening as a family and order the Buried Treasure Coloring Book from It Is Written. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw. My guest is Tammy, who was raised as a practitioner of Santeria, which is uh, witchcraft, essentially. In, in Haiti, it would be known as voodoo throughout much of the Spanish-speaking world, Santeria, the way of the saints. You were introduced to this as a young child. Really, you didn't have much choice in the matter. You grew up. You mentioned earlier, I thought it was very interesting. It's not something you spoke about. Did you ever confide in a friend and say, hey, I've got this stuff going on? Uh, yes. How did that work out? She listened. She maybe thought I was weird, but that was it. Yeah, but you didn't tell a lot of people. No, I didn't tell anybody else. Yeah. So throughout the Spanish-speaking world, Santeria is, is as common as common can be. Yes. And it's socially acceptable. Yes. Right? Yeah, people, people live with it and, it, and it's what those guys do it might even be what us do depending on who the person in question is but here in the united states do you see or do you perceive that santeria is practiced at all or very much what would you say i would say absolutely you know um a lot of the people from the spanish countries when they come uh, they bring all of that with them sure so to the common person they may not understand what the beads are or what certain wardrobe or you know the the clothes that they're wearing represent but it is very prevalent in the u.s you see it when you when it's there you see it yes you, I do. you, you recognize it right away right away okay okay raised with spirit guides and having dreams and you mentioned a conversation with the devil and so forth do you have a heightened sensitivity to the presence of witchcraft around you Every time I'm around a person who either is involved with witchcraft or maybe, maybe uh, this may sound weird, but maybe demon possessed, mm -hmm. this feeling in my stomach, it just turns and then I get the hairs that stand in the back of my neck and I, I don't feel comfortable. And, and the, my first reaction is to just run away from uh -huh. them. Have you ever intervened? Have you ever spoken to somebody and say, hey, can I help you or... Hey, I, I once was where you are, or maybe I know what you're dealing with. Have you ever had those conversations? I have spoken with people who have been demon-possessed and have prayed for them and have had experiences where their demeanor has changed afterwards. So let me ask you this. You can go to other countries and see pretty obvious evidence of demon possession. Yes. Here in the United States, or in many other first world countries, you might not recognize it quite so readily. Do you think there's much of it here in the United States, much demon possession? I think it's much more than what we think and believe because uh, we tend to look at things in a medical perspective. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that there is a medical aspect to no it. No question, yeah. But there are a lot of times where people are inviting the demonic presence into their lives. Where do you see evidence of demonic activity in society? Mostly in children's movies, cartoons. Children's? Yes. They target the young people. Because if, if you can condition the young people from the very beginning, then you will have more of a commitment as they get older. When you saw the Harry Potter series of books, becoming this explosive runaway success. It seemed like every kid was reading about spells and sorcerers and witches. What did you think? It broke my heart. And it made me really sad that a lot of parents are allowing this into their children's lives, not realizing the repercussions. Okay, let's talk about that. So. Some of these parents are thinking, oh, it's just good that my kid is reading and it's just a story and it's right. just fantasy. Right. You know that there's more to it than that. Why does it matter? It matters because the devil is real. He's very real. I spoke with him. I saw him. I experienced what he can do um, in somebody's life, what he did in my life, the torment, the torture when I came to Christ. 
it was, I, I was an insomniac because of it. And when he gets a hold of somebody, he doesn't want to let go. And I've lost many people because of him. So what you're suggesting is that by reading Harry Potter books, and I'm not going to say every, I, I, don't want to, I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying every kid who reads a page of a Harry Potter book is going to hell. I don't, I don't think Absolutely even you would not. say that. But what you're saying is that by placing a book like that in a child's hand, you're setting that kid up for what, possibly? Demon possession. Demon possession or demon, demonic harassment. What might that demonic harassment look like, kid, could you say? Um, at times, it can look like psychosis. At times, it can be behavioral issues. At times, it could be lack of sleep. At times, it could be um, just regular irritability. Um, there's no limit to what Satan is willing to do in order to destroy or torment a person. I wonder too if part of what many parents don't realize they're doing is they're just setting their child up for later. Yes, they are. Normalizing witchcraft, normalizing demonic activity, normalizing spells, so at some time in the future, there's going to be a terrible, terrible harvest that's reaped. Yes. Okay, so I went to Harry Potter, but let's come back here because I think Harry Potter is a pretty obvious one and many people simply don't understand that it's not benign and it is devilish. But where else do you see? They, you said targeting the children. How? How is the devil using witchcraft to target kids today in ways that many of us might not even recognize? Um, definitely in the music. Um, a lot of the music videos are normalizing Satan, talking to Satan, being with Satan, enjoying Satan. Um, a lot of people are glamorizing being uh, a part of his legion. The music, the, the, the video games, the right now TikTok is exploding with tarot card reading. You can go in the store, a local store, and, and just buy tarot cards you know, casting spells in your local Walmart. They're opening a door and it seems like fun, you know, and they experience things that are supernatural and it seems like fun, but it really isn't. You mentioned being harassed. Well, I, I want to talk in a few moments about the miracle of you coming to faith in Jesus and leaving this behind. Yeah. It seems like fun. Your warning would be, this may end up where and how? You know, I work with a lot of teens. That's my specialty. Mental health issue is on the rise and suicide is on the rise among them. A lot of them wanna die. A lot of them don't understand, they hear voices. They um, don't know where these things are coming from. The thoughts that they think where they're coming from I mean, a lot of them are written in lyrics, song lyrics. The influence is heavy. Hmm. And my guess is that many parents are unaware of what their kids are listening to. Yes. And watching. Yes. And being influenced by. Mm -hmm. What could a parent do? A parent who wants to safeguard their child. I don't think too many parents want to be too terribly reactionary and, 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 and overreact. But man, you don't want to underreact. Right. How can a, a parent appropriately react to first the danger that our kids are in today because this stuff is swimming around everywhere. Mm -hmm. And secondly, what if you do if you find out that there's tarot cards under your kid's pillow? First, how do we insulate our children mm -hmm. from the very real and present danger uh, they have to deal with every day? Well, I'm not a parent, so, um, but um, in my experience in working with children, is being honest, being honest and sharing with them the details. Yeah, some of them will not take it seriously, but when you share with them the repercussions and they may experience them and they'll remember. Having a conversation doesn't mean you'll always get a result immediately, but having that conversation plants the seed and definitely praying for them. What would you say if a parent came to you and said, I, I, I'm discovering that my kid is listening to this awful music that's oh, virtually devilish or they're, they're playing with some, whether it's cards or something else, perhaps you already answered the question, but what do you do when your kid is involved? Um, 
if they're rebellious, if they fight against it, I, I would say don't overreact. That's number one. If you overreact, the chances of them um, going towards it is stronger. Um, but just being there, um, explaining to them and supporting them. And I would probably say assess the amount of time that you're spending with them. If you're not spending quality time with them, how can they respect or even listen to your recommendation? Mm. Not to say that parents aren't doing that, but you, you would want to invest more time. Well, many parents aren't doing that. Mm-hmm. There's no, no question about it. So a- as a kid, you were raised in this, in this certain milieu. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was normal. You mentioned never really comfortable, but it was just sort of the, 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 the place you found yourself. Along the way, did you question, were you a 10-year-old girl saying, man, what is this that I'm into? Maybe I should be going in another direction. Did you have those thoughts? Did you ask those questions? I did. Growing up in the Catholic Church, um, even though um, you know Mary is the, the one who we turn to, Jesus was intriguing to me. And so um, he appealed to me in a different way. Um, I knew somehow that he was loving. I knew somehow that he was compassionate. I knew somehow he had something that I wanted. I just didn't know how to get to him. But along the way, you did. You did get to him. I did. So tell me what you can about how a a girl, a young woman raised to practice witchcraft gets away from that because you really did. How did that begin? How did that separation begin from, from practicing the dark arts to being rid of all of that and being a happy, thriving, ministry-focused Christian. I want to go back to to how that began. Mm. Yeah. You know, God meets you where you're at. Yes, He does. And He used the means of dreams to reach out to me. Um, Like, I used to do drugs and I was an alcoholic and... um, one time I had a dream, um, and it was a, a Native American witch doctor that mm-hmm. was talking to me and um, told me to give up smoking and doing drugs. So I woke up the next day and I did. So I believe that God used that. Um, also, I was getting into a lot of turmoil, um, a lot of things that were happening in my life. And so I went to a botanica to figure out what things I could do to protect myself. And I'm just going to jump in here. The botanic has like the little corner store where you might go and, 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 and get advice or buy the things you need to practice right. Uh, Santeria. Right. So yeah, you yeah, have yeah. the beads, you have the candles, you have the statues of the saints, and then there's the back room where the Santeria is. Yeah, okay. So you went there. I went there. And um, when I walked in, there was, uh, I waited for a little while, and a woman came out. Um, and usually in botanicas, the people that, that work there are Hispanic mm-hmm. or of the Caribbean descent. Uh, but this woman was an American, and she was very, she was, she was pretty, and she had short bob. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, what is she doing here? <laughs> yeah. She would have looked out of place, right? She did look out of place. And she asked, how can I help you? And I explained to her what... I need something for protection. What is the strongest thing that you have in here for protection? And she looked at me and she said, there's nothing here. It's your faith. And immediately I knew it was, she was talking about God. I don't know how, but I know why. And it was God reaching out to me telling me that I needed to get out of that lifestyle. Who was that woman? Did you ever find out? I never went back there again, but I wholeheartedly believe that it was an angel of God. Mm -hmm. Someone sent to intercept you and speak to you and encourage you. Yes. So you'd given up some of these unhealthy lifestyle practices. Yes. 
and and you were looking for some strong help the lady said your faith yes you internalize that as meaning i've got to turn to god yes how did you do that uh i met some people i received my first bible and i started visiting different churches until i found one that i felt really spoke the truth and i committed and my life changed not with not very easily i was tormented for yeah. a while you know satan doesn't want to let go of people that he has um, as prisoners but uh, by his grace i was set free okay here's what i'd like to do in just a moment i'd like to ask you about some of what you went through some of that that throwing off the shackles of of, of witchcraft and yeah. so forth what that looked like what you experienced, where that went. And we'll talk about your growth in Jesus and how he brought you to where you are today. Yeah. I'm so glad Tammy is here talking with me and I'm, I'm glad you're part of this conversation as well. I'm John Bradshaw. This is Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Thank you for remembering that It Is Written exists because of the kindness of people just like you. To support this international life-changing ministry, please call us now at 800-253-3000. You can send your tax-deductible gift to the address on your screen, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. Thank you for your prayers and for your financial support. Our number again is 800-253-3000, or you can visit us online at itiswritten.com. When an Italian priest told his congregation that he was going on a spiritual retreat, but was later rescued from a sinking cruise ship, he learned an important lesson. Truth matters. And the truth matters in the church, but a whole lot of what gets passed off as truth in the church today isn't. Don't miss the mouth of truth on itiswritten.tv. You'll visit captivating Italy, beautiful Bosnia. You'll see historical sites that attract people from around the world, and you'll discover how the church has been affected by teachings that don't originate in the Bible. Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. As planet Earth marches relentlessly toward the end of time, deceptions are on the rise. But it's the will of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, to keep us in the safety of His Word. You want to avoid deception. Don't miss The Mouth of Truth on itiswritten.tv. Did you know that more than half of Jesus' parables address our relationship with money and material possessions? As God's children, we're stewards of the resources on this earth, and God has given us examples of how to do that well and wisely. As we study managing for the master till he comes, we'll learn how God asks us to care for our fellow man and how to achieve financial freedom through financial faithfulness. Come along for this important study and learn what it means to steward Christ's resources here on earth. Join us for a new It Is Written Sabbath School study each week on itiswritten.tv. Hello, I'm Ed Reed, former director of the Stewardship Department for the North American Division and the author of this quarter's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Managing for the Master Till He Comes. Join myself and it is written Associate Speaker Eric Fleckinger for this quarter study in which we will learn what the Bible says about faith and finance, digging into the concepts of stewardship and the biblical principles of money management throughout the stages of life. In an age where not only individuals and companies but also entire cities and states are declaring bankruptcy, the timeliness of this message is more important than ever before. Miracles, events that can only be explained as the actions of an all-powerful God. If you look at the Bible, you'll find it's full of miracles. Parting the Red Sea, healing the blind, walking on water, raising the dead. Many have claimed these events never happened. But did they? Is it important for Christians to believe in miracles? And do they still happen today? Join me for Do You Believe in Miracles? We'll meet some remarkable people and hear some incredible stories. We'll learn what miracles are and what they're not. And we'll discuss the greatest miracle of all time. One that has significance for every human being on earth and the potential to change your life entirely. Do You Believe in Miracles? Brought to you by It Is Written TV. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. My guest is Tammy, who for a number of years was a practitioner of witchcraft. She was introduced to Santeria when she was a young girl, and this became 
a cornerstone, a foundational aspect of her life. But Tammy, it didn't stay that way forever. You mentioned a couple of interesting encounters you had yes. that turned you towards faith in Jesus. You got a Bible, you started looking at church, you started attending church, you found a church that you felt like was teaching the Word of God. But you know the devil doesn't tend to let people go without a fight. No. So what did you experience? Well, like I said before, um, I had a dream with, with Satan himself um, as I was desiring to leave Santeria, desiring to leave that lifestyle. One day I was at home and I took a nap. And normally I would leave the TV on because I couldn't sleep without television hmm. um, because of the torment in the dreams. Just the, the regular dreams that you were having. Right. As, as a practitioner of Santeria. Right. So this was going bad. Yes. Okay, this was not fun. It was not enriching your life. No, it okay. was getting very scary. And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but do you feel like that's typical for most people who are involved in that? Is it a joyful experience for their life or is there turmoil involved? There is a lot of turmoil involved. Mm. And the more turmoil, the, the deeper you have to go because you want to get the power. Yeah, so it pushes you further. It does. The turmoil increases. In order to get away, you run further and yes. so forth. So you're just chasing. Uh, okay, so you were saying you were having a dream and the devil was speaking to you. He was speaking to me. And in the dream, it was a dark place. Um, and I just hear a really, a really nice voice. He had a very uh, appealing look. He was light skinned, dark hair, very handsome looking, and his voice almost sounded like music to my ears. It was just really just romantic and, and pleasing. And um, as he pre you know, presented himself to me, he asked me if I was willing to do something for him. And I replied, if you tell me what it is, then I will let you know if I can do it. And he promptly said, no. I just want to know if you're going to do it for me. And then I'll let you know what it is. And I responded the same. No. Tell me what it is and I'll let you know um, if I can do it or not. And he quickly got upset. And um, we have a family portrait. And that family portrait flashed before me with all of my family members, and he began to threaten me. And as I looked at my family members, all of their faces became distorted. And basically he said that if I don't do what he tells me to do, then this is what he's gonna do to my family. Hmm. At that time, I was expecting my cousin to come and so I left my bedroom door open, but at that time, I don't know why she couldn't come in. The door was locked. And I had my phone next to me and she kept calling, but I didn't hear it. All I knew is that I was in this dream with, this, with Satan and he wouldn't let me go. And I was fighting to let go, but he wouldn't let me go. And my cousin, she is a Christian. And as she's standing out the door, banging on the door, screaming my name, I didn't hear any of it, um, she decided to call in the name of Jesus. And I believe at that moment, that's when he let me go. And I, I woke up with no recollection of the dream at the moment. I did feel weird, like my body felt uh, exhausted um, and she was asking me what happened, what, what was going on, how come I didn't answer the door, you know. And I, didn't, I told her I didn't, I didn't hear you. And that's when she explained to me that she called in the name of Jesus because she got worried. So that was my first encounter with Satan and that's what he was promising as I was coming out of Santeria, as I was coming out of the lifestyle. And that was the beginning of the, some of the most severest trials of my life. Mm. So uh, we don't need to get too terribly specific, but what sort of things were you encountering and dealing with? What were you up against? Well, he would try to kill me. So there were times where I was driving on the road and 
I would have a thought or I would jump out of my body and I would see my car going off of a bridge or, you know, flipping over. Um, one time I was on the highway and a black car came alongside on my left hand side and cut me off and I veered out of the way to avoid the accident and my car spun out of control and I ended up in the emergency lane um, facing the right direction and I remember a woman uh, stood uh, parked behind me and she saw everything that happened and she couldn't believe it and she just hugged me and I cried. So those are, those are some of the experiences and, and of course the torment at night, you know, the, the spiders rats the snakes that would crawl on me and they were very real they you know they felt just as real as if you were touching it yourself and i would wake up screaming or i would have nightmares of being chased of being murdered um a lot of things happened these little creatures you spoke about they were real or they were not real they weren't real but they felt they, very they, real these were an illusion or, or something or other that, yes. that, that the evil spirits were bringing to you. Yes. This had to be awful to go through. I did not sleep for many years at night. You didn't sleep for many years well at night. Yes. And, and, and this, was, this was happening to you as you were progressing out of Santeria. Yes. Did you ever say to yourself, oh, forget it. The battle is just too great. It would be easy for me just to go back to Santeria. Never. You never thought that? Never. Why did you never think that? Surely a person would say, oh, I can't deal with the rats and the snakes and the, the awful thoughts and the nightmares about dying. Well, it, there's a huge contrast between my experience with Satan in the dream and how I felt when I thought about Jesus. Okay, tell me about that. Jesus just had this warm, loving feeling that I just couldn't describe, and I wanted it more than anything in this world, and I knew he was the answer. I don't know how I knew. I just knew he was the answer. And that's when I started going stronger into it. And I wanted to get sleep. I would beg, I'd be crying many times at nighttime. You know, Lord, I just want to sleep. Somebody help me. And then I had an experience at church. Um, there was a sermon and nobody in the church knew that I was going through this. I didn't, I, I didn't know that this wasn't normal. I was just dealing with it. And in the sermon, this pastor talked about the power of Jesus, the power in his blood, the power in his name. And I, I remember telling myself, this is it. And when he explained that there is nothing stronger that that when you say his name all the demons flee mm -hmm. i said i'm gonna do it and i did it and what happened i slept at night with no nightmares no torment just perfect sleep <laughs> it felt so good hey so how long then when you had this this epiphany you, you heard the sermon and now you had some some spiritual weapons at your disposal how long before things evened out, sort of normalized? Was it instant or was there a, a leveling out period? When you say normalize, when it comes to my life, it was immediate. But when it comes to my family's life, it's still happening. Mm. Let me ask you this. The demonic activity stopped. Just stopped, right? For me. So it happened. Mm -hmm. you, it just stopped. You still live with very vivid memories. Yes. Very strong recollections of some of the stuff you lived, did, were subjected to. Yes. How do you maintain equilibrium today? How do you, how do you live at peace with these really strong and troubling experiences that you lived through? Um, I don't talk about what happened much to many people. Um, this is probably the second or third time, third time that I'm actually relaying this um, in a public manner. 
Um, there are very few people that know, that are close to me, that know bits and pieces. But really, what keeps me sane is that I read the Bible every day. If I don't have His Word and if I don't pray, Satan will come back and he will torment. He doesn't, he doesn't let up, but his powers are not um, in comparison to God's powers. Oh, it's interesting to hear you say that. Yes. You know, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you're a living testimony of that. Yes. That's interesting. By God's grace. Yeah. So, so I'm going to ask you this question. If you just quit praying and quit reading the Bible, what would happen? Without the power of Jesus present in your life, what would happen to Tammy? Where, 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 would you, where would you be a day, a week, a month, a year from now? To be honest, a few years ago I had an experience in my life that was one of the hardest trials that I have ever experienced, um, aside from coming out of Santeria. And um, I wanted to turn away from God. Because I thought to myself, how could you not help me? And I did stop reading my Bible. And I did stop praying. And the strong thought of committing suicide was there. That's interesting. If I don't have Jesus, I will be dead. But you have Jesus. I do. And you're very much alive. I am very much alive and happy to be and you're alive. And you're a living testimony of what God can do in a person's life. Amen. Thank God for you. So it's, it's not something you talk about readily, and I think it's probably very wise. When you do, like a conversation like this, is it easy enough to talk about, or does it cause you some pain and discomfort? I do experience... Um, demonic harassment usually so when like for instance coming here i had to fast and pray a lot um, for protection and for strength um, because i know that he doesn't like being exposed satan doesn't like being exposed in this way he wants to keep people blind and but if i can be somewhat of an instrument then i want to be that and so but, it, so, but it takes a lot of prayer. You know, I think what you're saying is true for everybody. Most people just don't realize without the Bible, without Jesus, our lives just crater and spin out of control. Yes. And we have to pray. We have to be uh, close to God. I was going to say at the top of our game. You, you understand what I mean yes, about I that? Yes, I do. Everyone needs to be connected to Jesus. Your battle has been what it was and, 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 and very um, graphic. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody is wrestling with exactly the same power as you wrestled with all those years. Yes. So it's a good reminder for you and for everybody. The spiritual battle is real. Yes, it is. We do wrestle with principalities and powers. There is a ruler of, of, of the darkness of this world, mm -hmm. and, and he, he's, he's after everybody, not merely people who practice santeria. No. But everybody. And of every age group. Yes. Yeah, interesting you would say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the devil isn't slowing down. If anything, you look around society, you see more and more, don't you? He's speeding up. Yeah, you see it everywhere. He's speeding up and he's uh, attacking in stronger ways and more bold ways. Explain. Well, um, I'm a midwife. And in midwifery, now in most schools, they teach spiritualism. They teach it? Yes, as a part of the practice. Um, and so I remember there was a time <laughs> where there was a, a, a mom. She was a first-time mom, and she had a doula who practiced spiritualism. And they let me know that they were praying to Isis and that this pregnancy, this labor is going to go wonderful, and that she has all her crystals. And, <laughs> and so I remember that she was in the birth tub, and she formed a triangle with the crystals. And you were in, in the, the middle room. of this. I refused to be in the middle of it. <laughs> so um, when I saw this happen, immediately, you know, that discomfort. Sure. So I went to the back of the room, uh, to another room 
um, in the birth center and I got on my knees and I prayed and I needed strength because I knew that what I was up against, I cannot handle and it's only uh, the power of God that can handle and fight. And uh, when I came back, I knew that I could not go in that, that triangle. So I just grabbed the crystal and broke the triangle and put it to the side and I was able to help her in her labor. It's real, isn't it? This battle is real, isn't it? Very real. I, I, just, I just hope that there's not a single person watching or listening who dismisses the reality of the gigantic spiritual battle we're in. It's not a joke. No, it's the real thing, isn't it? Yes, it if is. If anybody knows that, it's you. Even Disney, right? I, I, I don't want to name too many names, but even Disney's producing television programs isn't there a program now for kids based on Santeria? Is that right? Yes. I heard about it uh, recently. It's called Encanto. And when I saw the trailer, I was appalled. They're introducing this witchcraft to kids. I mean, it's, it's nothing new that Disney does this, but they're just doing it so openly and boldly now. And kids love it. Kids love it. And... I, I just can't believe that parents are allowing this into their homes. Well, I hope after you've spoken with me today, less parents will and Hopefully. more people will be a little more wise about the reality of, this, of the spiritual battle that we're in here. That's why I'm here. You know what, we're about out of time. But I've got to ask you, you're a volunteer firefighter. <laughs> what in the world? Yes. How did, that, how did that come about? And why are you busy fighting fires and... Cutting people out of cars. What, what are you doing that for? I mean, it's the most wonderful thing I think a person can do, but how'd you get involved? I enjoy helping people. Um, I got into midwifery because I wanted to be help teen moms in their labors, and I got into firefighting because I enjoy just helping people any way that I possibly can. And it's, it's active. I love being active. Yeah, exciting too, huh? Yes, it is. Very yeah, exciting. fantastic. Well, I think firefighting, as I said a moment ago, a very noble thing, and we're grateful to every firefighter there ever is or was, and I'm thankful to you for what you're doing to help your fellow human being. Amen. And thanks for sharing your story today. Thank you for having me. God has brought you on a journey. The journey's far from over. You're his, you're his child. You're serving Him. You're doing great things in the area of ministry and helping other people. And undoubtedly, because we've spoken here today, lots and lots of people are going to be blessed. By His grace. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Amen. And thank you for being part of this conversation. Uh, I, I hope you'll be prayerful about the world in which we live and the spiritual battles that we are called to fight. And remember this, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. I'm John Bradshaw. My guest has been Tammy. This has been our conversation. <laughs>